What's up, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Start Something Interview Series presented by USANA. I'm your host, Jason Nacy, and on today's episode, I got to connect with the professional beach volleyball star, Sam Pedlo. Enjoy the interview. So, your hair, man, it's super long, but you've, you've, I, so, you've trimmed the beard. Yes. So, the beard, like... I started seeing pictures of myself when I went to, because I moved to Florida at the start of the pandemic, not the start, sorry. This, the pandemic was going on for so long that I didn't know where it started and ended. So this was somewhere <laughs> somewhere in the middle where it was all a blur. Um, but essentially the beard started and I said I was going to grow it until I got to the Tokyo Olympics. And obviously yeah. that story didn't end with me at the Olympics, but I grew it until that point. And when I moved in February of 2021 to Florida, um, you know, I'm taking pictures, doing stories, things for social media, and then all these pictures are stored on my phone. And I didn't realize at the time how long it was. And then I got home and I started working. And uh, with physio, we had to wear an N95 and an N95 mask has to fit tight to the face. So my boss kind of made a compromise that if I cut the beard down, then I could keep it, but I could still wear an N95. Um, so I did that and I chopped it down and I was like, oh, it's not really that much shorter. And then I like looked back on my phone and it was like one year ago photos. And I looked back and I was like, oh my God, like it was like down yeah. Yeah. to like my pecs. I was like this, it it was so incredibly long. And then the hair got really out of control too, because the, the last haircut I got was actually like two weeks before COVID started. So I was going to uh, do a photo shoot for a sponsor I got home from training camp. I did this photo shoot and at the photo shoot, I was like, I need a haircut now. Like, cause I had a fade and uh, I didn't get one. And then I didn't get one until September of 2021. So my hair got like crazy long and I actually just got it like trimmed because it was getting so long. It was like down to my mid back. Like it was, it got to the point where it was no longer manageable. And I was like, I don't know what to do. So I just need to like adjust this up a little bit, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a pretty hairy COVID, that's for sure. <laughs> no pun intended. Or pun intended. <laughs> None. No pun intended. <laughs> well, and I just saw a video of you where you uh, on Instagram where you flicked your hair. And I was Did like, the hair flip, yep. holy cow. Like that was way longer than than I than I'd ever seen it. And that's that's just it. You see people on social media. I mean, that's how we do a lot of our communication, you know, or just catch it up with each other, whatever. And um, if somebody doesn't post for a while, they could look completely different. I mean, it's for sure. It, yeah. It, so I've been trying to grow my hair out okay. like, like a fool. This was probably six months ago. I cut it short again when it was getting long and, and I've resisted the temptation, even though like, conventions coming up i want to i you know i want to cut it to look good but i'm just like no you have I'm to just, get through the yeah. awkward in between stage right the yes. awkward in between stage is the worst because every day you wake up you're like i should get a haircut today yeah i should get a haircut today but the rule is you have to wait a week and if after a week you still want a haircut then you can get a haircut but if you've come to your senses and you realize you're just going through the awkward in between stage then hopefully you can do that long enough that you pass through that stage and you know end up at like the aquaman stage or whatever you're going for <laughs> yeah. i don't, i probably won't go that long but like this is the longest it's ever been like i've got to kind of slick well, back look so, great. so it doesn't look long thank you i appreciate that but uh but yeah, just feeling it on my neck is something I've never, because I've I've always had it pretty. I wouldn't say high and tight all the time, but I've I've always had pretty short hair, at least on at least on the sides. So well, now you've moved out to the coast, so like you just need long hair, don't care to yeah. fit in, right? Yep. Like you're you're like an East Coast surfer guy now. So <laughs> yeah, the flow is coming. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I remember when we came out and filmed you, man, was it 2018 or 19 when uh, yep. when we came up to Toronto? And you had just gone to the barber and got it cut. So I think the last time I saw you in person, it was it was a fade. 
Yeah. And <laughs> that's, that's what started before COVID. And then it just grew into like what I have now, which is always in like a, a man bun. And again, right now is like way, sh I got like six inches cut off it. Like it was down to like here and now it's, it's here, but yeah, this is the, I used to have long hair in high school because I just, I skied all the time and I didn't yeah. care about my hair and I just chucked it under a hat. And uh, then I went short for like, all through university when we were rookies for the volleyball team one day we all shaved our heads in the shower just unprovoked we were like let's just shave our heads because we thought it was a good idea it wasn't um but then i had short hair since then so so i go through the same thing with my beard like i've i've had a beard most my adult life and at least since my mid-20s right and now i'm in my mid-40s um, I have shaved it a couple times and every time, cause sometimes I just, I like to just try something different or sometimes it's just like, mm -hmm. okay, let's get rid of it all, you know, get the, get the skin under it, you know, a little better, whatever. Um, and man, every time I do it, it's like, ugh, why did I do that? And my wife, because I've only, I've only shaved it twice since I've, since I've known my wife and the first time I did it, she was like, that was a horrible idea. <laughs> She's like, and, and that's the problem when somebody gets used to a certain look, right? Like all my kids do, oh, exactly. they're just like, oh yeah, no, don't, don't do that. Don't do I that. I constantly, like now that I'm, I'm working, I'm like, you know what? I'm going just mustache. Like I'm going to go mustache. I'm like really tight with everything else. And then I was like, no, I can't do that right before convention. I need to, I need to keep the beard. Well, so I did shave everything but the mustache. It was getting pretty full. I've never, I've never had my beard like, like you. I just, I don't, I don't know if it would grow that long. Um, and mine just starts mm -hmm. looking, even when I go to a barber, and have him trim it up. It just it it doesn't look good because it kind of pokes out um, on mine. But we were we had an '80s party, and I was like, "All right, I'm just I'm gonna cut it all except for the mustache." And uh, yeah, I wore that look for a little bit. I didn't, but I didn't bick it. I just took my um, trimmer, yeah, yeah, just, just uh, on the lowest setting, which takes exactly. it to the skin, but it's not like. It wasn't. It's not a clean yes, shave. It wasn't a clean shave, and and I haven't mustache with mustache with just a clean shave is a bold look. Yeah. Like uh, I don't know how many guys are pulling that off effectively. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. Um, I look like a different person. I I totally totally did, and uh, and then I, you know obviously I left it for I probably left it like that for a week, and then I trimmed the mustache up, not super short, but kind of letting everything professional short. Yeah. Trying to let everything blend <laughs> together a little. <laughs> so, but, uh, as much, as, as much as you can with a mustache yeah, on your face. Yeah. So what we've decided from this conversation is that next Saturday we are having mustaches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm going to die. If you show up in a mustache, that'd be awesome. I don't know if I can, <laughs> no one will take me seriously. Yeah. Yeah, it's if anyone does already. It's coming back though. The mustache is coming. Like it's all because of Top Gun, right? Everyone this summer has a mustache because of Top Gun, which I haven't seen yet. Um, and probably most of the reason I want to see it is because of the mustaches. Dude, it's fantastic. I saw it the day it came out. Um, the internet was exploding with uh, with memes from the Miles guy with his his dancing, which is no longer a volleyball scene, but a football scene, because this Top Gun, although it was great, it really like uh, overshadowed all of the success volleyball has had in Hollywood. And really the only success volleyball has had in Hollywood is via Tom Cruise and that volleyball scene in the original Top Gun. And now that they changed it to football, like... I think volleyball is just like right on the back burner again. Yeah. yeah. I, I got to admit, I was a little bummed that that scene wasn't in there. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously they had to have something in there, you know, and yeah. the way they worked it in was, it was, it was pretty funny, pretty clever, um, you know, team building type of a thing. But, uh, but that was just an excuse to have a bunch of ripped dudes with their shirts off running around it tackling each other in the sand so yeah 
That sounds pretty on <laughs> brand with Top Gun, right? <laughs> you gotta, there's got to be something for everyone in there. We there's lots of plane, uh, you know, fighter pilot action, but there definitely has to be some some of the the glamour shots, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I gotta say though, it was it was a fantastic story, and the cinematography. I mean, you know, that was a big part of my life for like two decades, and mm-hmm. you know, usually I don't pick apart films. I can just like. It is, it is what it is. I just, yeah, I just enjoy it for what it is. But when something's spectacular, it's just like, wow. Like when there's things that happen in it that, that they do such a good job. It's like, I I catch myself saying, how did they do that? And then I start. So, so I analyze it more when it's really well done. And if it's not well done, it's just like, eh, you know, I don't, I don't analyze it. So, but, uh, and it yeah. was it was it was really cool for sure. I love the line Tom Cruise had when he was because I guess the guy Miles, the actor, got sick and he came back and he told Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise like, "Are you okay?" And he's like, "Oh, Tom, you know, I got some bad news. You know, they they did they did blood work and they found jet fuel in my blood." And Tom Cruise just goes, "Yeah, I was born with that." And I was like, "This guy is." built to be this role like every role he has done is leading up to the top gun sequel yeah. and he's just ready to capitalize on this yeah. it's it, it's funny because my 15 year old um it came out like within days of his birthday so i was like oh let's do that yeah. let's do that for your birthday i'll take you to take you to top gun and so this was like a couple weeks before he's like dad let's watch let's watch the original top gun i was like okay and do you remember the old Top Gun? Like, it's one of those things, like, the old, like He-Man, I remember as a kid, I loved, and then it was on Netflix, and I tried watching it with my kids, and I was like, how? How did we, how did we watch it? <laughs> like, it's just so corny, so, like, over-the-top corny, right? Um, and that's Top Gun. And I was just like, oh, man, there was just parts I was just dying because it's, it's so corny. And at the end of it, so fu- my son, yeah, he's like, he looks at me and he's like, "That's the best movie I've ever seen." And I started laughing because I Amazing. thought he was being sarcastic. And he was, and he kind of looked at me funny, and I was like, "Are you are you serious?" And he's like, "Yes, it's the best movie I've ever seen." And I was like, "Dude, then I can't wait for you to watch the new one because I can only imagine how that how that's gonna be." Amazing. I can remember where I was when I first saw Top Gun. We used to go to New Year's Eve at my um, Uncle Ted and Aunt Carla's. And I remember the whatever the end of the year when Top Gun came out on that New Year's Eve, the plan with like all the dads and uncles was we were going to watch Top Gun in the basement. And I remember that was the first time I ever saw Top Gun. And then obviously the volleyball scene was like incredibly popular. And then in university so i did five years at queen's university our coach always let us pick the entire playlist for warm-up and our warm-up was an hour long and um uh we always had the top gun song in like the last three songs of it and it was like kind of this cult thing with our team that and like the free willy song and then this like one madonna song we always played the michael jackson madonna and and top gun and we would know all the words to this top gun song and every halloween a couple of guys on the team were always dressed up as top gun and it's just it's funny how those things happen and then here in canada our amusement park that's like it's called canada's wonderland it's kind of in between toronto and barry but that's where you go as a kid in the summer they came out with a Top Gun ride, and that was like the big ride they came out with that summer. And it's like if you went to Canada's Wonderland, you always had to go on to go into Top Gun. And it, it's like it used to be Paramount Canada's Wonderland, so it was all like movie themed. Um, but yeah, it's just hilarious how that movie took over. And now what they're doing is capitalizing on all the people who saw it back then, and now they're like older and they bring it back, but then they get the whole new generation. So it's wild. They did it well, right? Uh, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm. Uh, it's been on the list of, of things to do, which is quite lengthy at yeah. this point. Well, I mean it's it's gonna be it's gonna be out here soon on uh, on video or or digital, yeah, that's, whatever that's whatever we call it now. Back when I was growing up, it, something where we yeah, can stream it yeah. off our phone. <laughs> Back when I was young, it was like it's coming out on VHS. <laughs> Go to Blockbuster, yeah. Yep. Yeah. and you go see the wall, and all of them are rented, and you're like, oh, yeah. God, what am I going to do now? All right, so I have to ask you, with this conversation we've been having for the last 10, 15 minutes, 
if you were to title this start something what would what would what would come after the start something based on based on this conversation <laughs> i i think you know, I've uh, I've tried to been think about thinking about that, and um, it's almost like start something now. I think, you know, if I look at my career and the way that I am as an individual, um, I always come up with all of these ideas or conversations or projects, and for the longest time, I, I had these all on the back burner, like. Being like, you know, they're not ready. I'm not, I'm not ready to either start this. I'm not ready to put this out into the world. I'm not ready to apply this to the, the sport that I'm playing, whatever it might be. And I think that mentality of like, oh, it's not quite ready or it's not quite perfect, like held me back for so long to be able to like, you know, take whatever it is, whatever area that I'm trying to improve on to the next level. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I started to realize that like, having skin in the game was so valuable like start it start it now and and get it out there and it might not be it might not be perfect and it might need revisions but you know we're we're like conscious enough and um you know like success oriented enough to be able to take feedback if it isn't where it needs to be and get to that that next level right but if you don't start it and and you don't put it out into the world it, it's never going to happen right so i think if we were to kind of pick a title it would be like start it now and like just just do it like stop holding yourself back and, and just start so, it now i like where you're headed if i based on based on the conversation we just had i would call it start something awesome because we're talking about mustaches movies all that <laughs> but be bo do yeah, something you're scared of. <laughs> there you go there you go um but I like the theme of start something now um, moving forward because, dude, you hit it on the head. I think so many of us want things to be perfect. And it's, and it's, not, that, it's not that we are making excuses. It might seem like excuses, but I think it's valid that people really, it's like, okay, if you, if you want to start a podcast, Oh, you want to have the right microphone. You want the right camera. You want the right backdrop. You want, you know, you you want it to look perfect going out of the gate. But what that ends up doing is not happening. I remember um, a, a, a few years back, Gary Vanderchuk came to our convention, and he talked about that same yeah. thing. He's just like, it doesn't have to be perfect. If you wait for it to be perfect, it will never happen. He's like. If you want to start a podcast, you have a phone. Just do it from your phone. And it might be crappy right at first, but then you're going to grow. You're going to build on it. You're going to learn. It's going to get better. And, and then eventually it'll be, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get your identity and you'll figure out how you want to do it versus trying to do all that up front, front loading that because you want to come out with something perfect and and it never happens so I, I i love that theme let's go let let let's let's roll with that theme because that's uh that's i think really important and can really help people listening yeah and i think you touched you know you touched on it there one of the things that's interesting even if you use that podcast example right you can plan and prepare and create this perfect concept and then you get on camera with someone and it just goes to pure right? Like, oh, you thought you had the best interviewing skills in the world. You know, you thought you were going to be able to control the narrative. And then you learn a whole lot on that first episode, right? So it's like, even though you you procrastinated and, and put off starting until you felt like you had the perfect scenario, yeah. then life happens, right? So it's no matter how much we plan for it, it's very often going to go exactly as we've we've pictured it. And there's there's just so much learning in actually doing it right so you know that first episode you're probably always going to look back on it and be like what was i doing but you started right and now look where you are as a result of you know putting some skin in the game and applying yourself to just improving from the you know mistakes you've made and, at the and start and i think one way that we can look at it that might help is it's that story of 
progression. Because 10 years from now, when you might be amazing at, at what you started, you're going to look back and yeah, it might be embarrassing how it was, you know, how you were when you started or, or, you know, things didn't go as planned, but there's that cool story of progression as you get better, as you learn more and you start crafting this idea or this business or whatever it is, um, you know, and, and, and I think that kind of adds to the, uh, the, the, the story of whatever it is you're starting right now. Yeah, it's kind of like that fallacy of overnight success, right? Like we think that there's all these stories of like, yeah, it's just it just happened immediately. Like they took one swing and they hit a home run. And, and sure, there are those cases. There's always those cases in whether it be business, athletics or academia, whatever you want to, whatever area you want to look at, but that's, it's very rarely the case, right? It's, it's not usually someone's first at bat that's creating that success story. They've been at it and they've applied themselves and they've made those adjustments. And then what we're seeing now is the product of, of all of that. Right. But if you were too scared to even start, then none yeah. of this would have happened. Yeah. So let's jump. Cause, cause I, I, I like what you said there. Um, and I think that applies to an athlete as well, like that overnight success, right? I'm, I'm sure people look mm -hmm. at how successful you've been. You are ripped. Um, you know, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you look like you fit in one of those Top Gun scenes, right? Um, and I, I think it's easy for people to look and say, oh man, like, that guy just has good genetics or, you know, what, whatever. And look, we're, we're all built different. And, and for, for me to look like you might be harder, might be easier. Who knows? Who knows? Um, and that's not the point, right? But, but let's dive into a little bit of, of some of the, the struggles that, that you've had over the years, because it's easy to look at how successful somebody is and say, Oh yeah, they've got it. They've got it all together. But, you know, I think I think we all we all struggle with stuff. What are what are what are some of the things that you struggle with that you deal with? Yeah, and I mean, I've always been like ever since I was a little kid, like an extremely like organized and regimented person. And um sport isn't an organized and regimented situation like obviously now i'm i'm slightly removed and my environment is much more stable and my day-to-day -day life is significantly more let's call it standardized over the course of a week over the course of a month i thrive in that you know people like right now it's crazy, but my alarm goes off at 3.30. I start my workout at 4.30 to 6.30. I work from 6.30 till 8.15, take my kid to daycare. Like my day is very structured and organized and I, I excel in that environment. Um, and that helped me become very good at volleyball because I was able to identify, you know, where, where was I lacking? Where did I need to go? How can I approach this scenario in order to improve these, these gaps? I'm, uh, I'm, I, I've identified for myself, um, but the actual application of the sport is yeah. not that, right? Uh, you know, you look at these tournaments, which tournaments are you going to get into? Which tournaments are you not going to get into? You might get into a tournament four days before you would have to fly to it in Europe or across the world in Asia. You might be in Asia, you get into a tournament in South America the next week. It's a different tournament than you thought you were getting into. And then you need to adapt to be able to thrive in that environment. And I did I didn't do well with that right away. It was it was really challenging, and and one of the most like apparent situations for me um, that that like lack of self or lack of control of the situation that caused me like panic as an athlete was a lot of people don't realize this in our tournaments with beach volleyball, even at the highest level. Like we play at the highest level in the world, I don't find out my schedule sometimes until like yeah. eleven o'clock p.m. the night before, and I might play at eight a.m. 
I'm so structured that my bedtime is like so regimented. I go to the bed at almost like within the 15 minutes every single night almost. And then to understand that I won't even know the schedule until what might be three hours past my bedtime, then I need to game plan and then I need to actually fall asleep and prepare for the next day. So this concept of like letting go and understanding that I don't have control over everything and and then that is okay was, was something that was, you know, really instrumental in me being able to like not only perform but also like mentally survive being a professional yeah. athlete um, that, that that's a great point so i went to my first professional beach volleyball tournament uh over the weekend and yeah and it rained Atlanta. um every yeah yeah the whole so time. it was you know i i as a spectator you know because because i was there just to watch a friend, right? Um, uh, a particular individual. So I wanted to make sure that was Casey Patterson, we both, uh, you know, mutual friend. I actually met Casey through you, yep. which, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's Amazing. honestly how I became friends uh, with Casey was that shoot that we did um, down in California uh, years ago. But awesome. so, I mean, my whole point going was to watch and support Casey. And, you know, so I didn't really care about some of the other matches that, that were happening. And I don't know a ton about beach volleyball to, to know, you know, who's doing what and whatever, right? All the stories, all the stories behind it. So, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of scheduling my day to watch one particular person helps me understand what you are saying right now. Like, holy cow, I thought I was going to watch him at two and then that gets canceled. And then I don't want, yeah. 8 and it PM when like, they play. Wow. Okay. And then, um, they even had to swap the format out, which I'm sure you've, you've, you've had yep. a lot of experience with that to where it was one game to 28. Um, because they had to, they had to play catch yep. up. When you're normally yeah. playing two out of three, right? Yeah, it's crazy. I always say there's a there's a movie that we used to watch at Queens uh, when I was there called Bull Durham, and one of the lines Kevin Costner has is "Some days you win, some days you lose, some days it rains." And we would answer interviews with that all yeah. the time, but it, it's so true. And a couple of those examples have actually come up, you know. In my career, one of them, the first international tournament I ever played was in Puerto Rico, and we were playing in July, end of July, so it was like hurricane season, and the tournament was supposed to start on Friday and end on Sunday. Um, we landed on Tuesday, hurricane came in on Wednesday, hurricane flooded all the courts until Sunday, so we had a three-day tournament turned into a one-day tournament where you played games to 15, wow. I think, to get to the final. So again, this is my first international tournament ever. I'm so fired up with my partner. We're coming off like a fourth place finish at Canadian Nationals where we didn't think we were even going to get that far. We fly to Puerto Rico. We're, we're ready to get a medal in this tournament. We ended up getting third, but like we were playing in puddles. Like there was nothing they could do. It's like, this is, this is the way it has to happen. And yeah, you just have to understand you have no control when the tournament's going to start, what the format's going to be, who you're going to play, all of these things. And, uh, you know, probably the most uh, most recent example that's happened was uh, the last Olympic qualification. So for 2021 for Tokyo, we were playing the last chance qualifier in Mexico and we'd moved to Florida to train for Tokyo heat. And we also knew our qualifier would be in Mexico. So we wanted to be like the most heat acclimated we could possibly be. So I moved down to Florida because we, again, we could also fly in yeah. and out without having to quarantine like we did in Canada, left my baby, baby's only eight weeks, no control over this, just got to go. Baby can't come down because COVID's like too weird. Just like, okay, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to do. Training for this event in Mexico. We're, we're training at like the middle of the day in Florida every day, 12 o'clock, hottest it could possibly be. Like borderline, yeah. you're like, I don't know what we're doing. We're so hot. Heat stroke is like right there, but we're like, this is what we're supposed to do because we need to beat Mexico. They're going to put us right in the middle of the day because they're going to try and make us tired. 
everything's going according to plan. We wake up the day of the match. It is the worst rain I have ever played in in my life. And it was like 16 degrees. So we were ex- training in like plus 40 and then it was like 16 cold and rainy. And I was like, well, there's nothing you can do. Just go out there and, and give it your best. And it was, it was bad. Like it was awful. It's just so incredibly hard to play in those conditions. And we did the best we could, but that's how we missed the Olympics, right? We've trained for four years expecting to be playing this one particular match in in you know extreme heat environment and then we ended up trying to side out in torrential downpour so how do you cope with that i think you have to have a conversation with yourself and something you have to be okay with or a standard you have to set for yourself is that you are always going to give a hundred percent and that hundred percent is going to differ day to day you know there's going to be days when you wake up and you've got food poisoning and you got to go side out and you got to try and win a match because that match is probably going to pay your rent for that month. And if you don't, then you got to figure out a way to do it later. Um, but you know, if you've got food poisoning, your hundred percent is going to look a whole lot different than if you're the stars align in that perfect situation. And I think that concept of just, that's the standard you hold yourself to like, no matter what I'm going to go out and give myself that, 100% effort, the outcome, it's kind of cliche, but it's really irrelevant at that point, right? Like whether you win or lose, you can be happy as long as you held yourself to that standard that you went out there and and you gave 100%, no matter what the conditions are or or what other external factors are influencing your performance. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's, that's great advice. You know, it's sometimes easy to, uh, to, I love the quote from Mike Twi- Mike Tyson. Um, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? Yeah. And and that's that's true. Um, and I think with that analogy, we're always all going to get punched in the face. Like it never it can ne- it you you can you can just like in your story um, training in Florida, you can do everything by the book. And, 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 and practice for and, and train yourself for every scenario, but you can't really for every scenario because there's always freak things that happen. And I think just like finding, like being okay with that and finding comfort in that, like letting a, a, an element of that control go is, is critical, not just for an athlete, but for you know, everybody, whether you just work a nine to five or you take care of your kids or whatever it might be, there's always going to be a situation where like there's going to be the unexpected, there's going to be the unprepared for, and you just, you have to be adaptable. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, so I used to love cycling, um, got in a bad cycling accident, haven't really cycled since, but in Utah, you can't go anywhere without going up a hill. Um, Mm -hmm. you can avoid mountains if you want to, but you can't, you can't avoid the hills and cycling. People hate going up the hills or the mountains. It's just, it's awful. Right. And people, people try to avoid it. And in their minds, they just, they have this mindset that it's just, it's grueling. Um, and I was that same way, but I thought early on in cycling, I was like, all right, I'm going to try and embrace this and I'm going to try to and I don't I can't really say fake it but it's like how can I enjoy this and -hmm. become good at it to where I see a hill and it's like all right I want to conquer this right and it took a lot of it took a lot of work um, but eventually I got to that point where I loved climbing the mountains I mean those were my favorite rides they they were grueling and they were always hard but I just felt most comfortable when I was going up a hill on a bike. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and when I say most comfortable, I was super uncomfortable. But, but I made it like in my mind, I told myself, this is, this is what I want to do. I want, I, want, I want to be a climber. I want to, um, I want to conquer this. And um, I think it's, it's easy to psych yourself out. But it's also easier than people think to to kind of change just 
a little tiny something in your mind to help you overcome something that, uh, that, that, that might be difficult. And I know it's easier said than done, but you know, I, I mean, I, I did the same thing. I've, I've told this story before, um, several times, but I did not like the snow in Utah. And every time I had to go and shovel my walks, it drove me nuts. And then, and then one year I thought, what's something I could do that would, that would change my attitude on this. And I got into skiing. And once I got into skiing, it was like the more it snowed, the happier I was. I didn't mind going out there and, and, and shoveling two feet of snow because I knew it was even more in the mountains. Right. And nothing changed with the environment. It's just, just your perspective. Yeah. It's the perspective. It's your mentality on it. It's like, okay. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I think the, no, the concept of the hill I like, because I think it touches back on the original theme that we were discussing is just the, the, the start it now. And sometimes, you know, you look at these, whether it be a hill or a challenge and, or a task we have to do. And the actual thought of it is more intimidating or worse than actually doing it right. Like this, you know, you look at your Strava or whatever, and you look at your route and you're like, Oh God, we got to climb whatever elevation in this particular ride and you sit there and you stew because you remember last time that you know it was a real burner and like lactate threshold was coming into play and it sucked at the time and you know you psych yourself up or you have this to-do list and you look at these items and you're like i you just you have that one you've put off for a week and now it's two weeks and you're starting to get self-conscious because it was supposed to be due and you haven't followed through and then in both situations you usually start it and you're like this was like, why did I hype this up in my brain to be this this hierarchy that I thought was going to be so bad? Yeah. And then it's really just not that bad, right? I think we create that story in our brain all the time. Yeah, no, that's 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 a perfect example. I can't tell you how many times I've had something around my house that's just <laughs> bugged me, but not enough to do something. And then when I finally <laughs> fix it, it's like, why five minutes why didn't i do that like months ago instead of every time walking past it like uh i don't want to deal with that i don't want to deal with that see it and for me like i'm now back in the clinic working as a physio two days a week and it's not a lot right like i'm only there for you know i'm three days some weeks so i'm there for like 20 hours a week maximum and uh i gotta do my charts at the end of the day right so i see all my clients that's the best part of physio i get to yeah. work with you hands on we get to make some meaningful change right there have good conversations and then i gotta go write about it at the end of the day right like because my clients are back to back to back to back i don't have time to yeah. write this down during the day so my my mom was a physio for 40 years. She's like, make sure you get your charts done before you go home. I'm like, no, mom, I only work two days a week. I got like three days to do these. Never do them until like 10 minutes before the next shift. And I was just watching this podcast by Jocko and he's like the ex Navy yeah. SEAL. You know, the, the motivation is discipline is freedom like that's yep. something i very much uh live my life by but he was talking about you know the weekend like okay you have something to do on friday afternoon for your job and you're like nah i'll just get it done on saturday and then sunday comes you're like ah, i'll just take five minutes to get it done on sunday we never do that right yep. and it, it ruins like the whole weekend instead yep. of just like getting it done so we just got to start <laughs> i'm trying to get way better at getting my charts done because i know they hang over my head the weekend like the baby's sleeping yeah. and i'm like mm, i could get my charts done right now that's probably a good idea and then i'm like no i'm gonna sleep too yeah and then it comes into the next nap and it just continues on that awful cycle and i'm glad you brought that up because i think that's something that everybody deals with i don't i I would be surprised if there's a person alive who doesn't deal with that at some level. I mean, obviously, some yep. of us are better than others, but at, 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 at some level, I think we 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 all deal with that. Um, but there are people who have mastered it. I, I have no doubt on that. But uh, but all right, one last question. Um, I've, I've, <laughs> I've already taken up too much of your time, but. Going into this theme, starting something new, um, well, it was start something now, but I want to go into the start something new with you, with, you know, mm -hmm. starting a new family. Uh, it's been, it's been, 
fun to watch your daughter grow up some of the posts that you're doing. How, how old is she now? She's 18 months. Man, now. Time so, flies. Yeah, she's 19 months, 19 months next month. So yeah, it's, it's wild. Like I got, I left, uh, when she was eight yeah. weeks. So when we were having the baby, we were always planning to have a baby after the Olympics and then the Olympics got postponed yeah. and we were just trying to figure out what the situation was. We're like, let's just go with our original plan. So we're just going to have a baby. So we did. And the, um, we were like, we have to have it this month. Like it has to, the, the stars have to align and it's got to work on this first try or we have no time. And because the Olympics are coming. So like, we got to go now because if, if it doesn't happen this month, I will potentially not be home for the birth. Yeah. Like I will be in Qatar playing volleyball, trying to qualify for the Olympics. And we said, okay, let's try. And it worked and it was fantastic. But that being said, I also knew that I was going to have to train for those weeks leading into this Olympic qualification event. So my mother-in-law moved into the house and um, she stayed with us for eight weeks straight. And then she stayed with my wife. My wife's uh, mother stayed with us the entire time I moved to Florida. So I was gone. Um, and that was like really challenging because I had this like little tiny blob that I was taking care of for all hours outside of my training, which was still like, really extensive. And you feel like a new dad and you've got like that new dad high and then you leave and you're like, okay, well now it's just, it's back to volleyball and I get to talk to my wife on FaceTime when the baby will allow it. And, and that's it. But then I got home on July 11th of last year and then I have spent so much time with them. Like that's been my priority over the last year is just spending time with my wife and baby. But yeah, time flies. Like I can't believe how big she is and what she can do, but it's, it's really exciting. So what's, one thing that you didn't expect um, when you were thinking about becoming a dad to now being a dad, is there is there one thing that you're just like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that, but this is probably one of the biggest things. Again, I think um, like I'm very structured and I didn't, know how I was going to be able to like fit the things in that were like like so a part of my core over the last 10 years while still being a dad right like for the last 10 years my life has been a hundred percent structured around being successful at volleyball and I'm, you know, I'm no longer pursuing the Olympic games and beach volleyball, but there's still those core tenants within me, like, you know, training and, and now I'm, I'm in the office and now I've started my own business and being a dad when I was just playing volleyball was completely different with like being a dad now that volleyball is not the first priority. And I just, I didn't know how I was going to be able, I honestly didn't think I was going to be able to do it. I thought I was going to have to sacrifice a lot and I've just over the last year now created a system, albeit a system that like many people wouldn't be willing to do, um, to still be able to focus like a hundred percent on that aspect of my life, like being the best possible father and husband I can be, but also like really pushing myself in, in those, those other areas. So, I mean, I didn't really expect to be able to do it all, but piece by piece and, and honestly taking a, a chance on, on myself, it's, it's really been, it's probably been one of the best years of my life is like the last 12 months, which is, which is really exciting. Yeah. It's, it's an un, unbelievable feeling becoming a dad for the first time. That's what I always tell people. It's just mm -hmm. the emotions are crazy. You know, you, you think, you know, what love is. Um, and I always explain to people, yeah, I, I, I love my wife, but when my first child was born, I felt a different kind of love that I never, that, that I never experienced before. Right. And it's that like, you want to, you, cause my first, um, is a, is a girl as well. So it was like, you, you have these mm -hmm. like fatherly instincts, like you want to protect her. You want to, I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was crazy the emotions that I felt uh, the first time being a, being a dad. No, and I agree. And I think it, for me, what it's done is it's changed the, like the why in a lot of the things that I do, um, you know, like 
work, for example, and like starting my own business, you know, the why was, you know, thinking about like yeah. financials previously, right? But now we're thinking about like, well, like why I'm actually doing this? Well, it's like, it's to instill, you know, values that, you know, your daughter will look up to, you know, hard work, perseverance, like the ability to overcome challenges. You know, it's, it's now part of like your, your family legacy, right? Like you want to leave your child in a better situation than, than you were in. Right. So it's, it's kind of reframed, you know, how I go about my day to day in a completely different way, because, you know, before it was all about like, how can I be successful at volleyball? And now it's like, I just, I, I lost you. I don't know if you hit mute. My audio cut out there for a minute, didn't it? Oh, just for a second. Yeah. yeah. Cause some telemarketer decided to call me during our our super in-depth talk here. So now we got to, <laughs> now we got to restart what our question was. <laughs> well, you, uh, you were saying, yeah, the, the, the most important part <laughs> cut out. Yeah, it wasn't really the most important part, but it was, you were like, it was right at the climax of what you were talking about. <laughs> so I was like, we're, we're going to edit that on this. my end. Is that, a, is that no, it's, it's a, it's a telemarketer called me and I thought it would, the audio would kick back in. So I waited a second, but no, it just ruined all yeah. our flow. It's probably someone calling about good. duct cleaning, which is just the worst thing ever. <laughs> yeah. I never answer my phone if I don't, uh, if if I don't know who it is, I just send it straight to voicemail. I should so. I should know better and put my phone on airplane mode for these situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I think it's 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 been amazing watching you you uh, over over your career, um, especially as you becoming a dad. I think that's been been awesome to watch. I can see the uh, the pride that you have, <laughs> um, and she's adorable. By the way, like one of the cutest babies. Um, and but yeah, it's been it's been super fun um, getting to know you over the years, and I really appreciate all you've done for Usana as an ambassador, and uh, and just you're you're an amazing person. And thanks again for taking the time today to to do this video well i appreciate it, jason anytime i can get a chance to connect with you i'll take it and i'm uh definitely looking forward to uh seeing you next week back at uh the old stomping ground that's uh after so many years it'll be uh, exciting to be able to attend for the first time absolutely absolutely well thanks for everything um yeah have a good one sounds good buddy